Assalamu alaikum jamee'an. I would like to uh, welcome you all to the Smart and Sustainable Solutions for Urbanism event today, carried out by the Technology and Business Society. I will be moderating the session today, and I will start by introducing myself. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Aisha Bushagir, the chairperson of the Computer Engineering Department at the University of Bahrain and advisor to the Board of Technology and Business Society. I am really glad and um, honored to be moderating the session today with our distinguished speakers, Dr. Rafay uh, Abdullah Al-Khalifa and Professor Sarah Wilkinson. So um, let me um, start here by uh, giving you a brief uh, about the Technology and Business Society, which is um, a society that has been established and licensed in September 2012. And uh, to shed a light on our vision and mission in the society, we look to improve the information technology industry in the Kingdom of Bahrain in order to compete in a global scale. Uh, our mission is to offer the latest innovative information technology services to small and medium enterprises at the Kingdom of Bahrain. And our core values at the, at the society is to really contribute in a very innovative and efficient way to the society and to be an exemplar society uh, in terms of competition uh, with others in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Um, we have uh, strategic objectives at the uh, society and we really take them uh, into account seriously. We uh, like to be recognized regionally, nationally, and even internationally as a, a, a society that uh, supports innovative and digital transformation. We also like to attract high quality members from different disciplines, um, similar to our guest speakers today and our distinguished members. We also um, focus on corporate relations. We have uh, robust relations with the industry nationally and internationally. And uh, we're looking forward to promote our society uh, even further. Uh, we have been engaged in several initiatives for the past few years, thanks to the different um, board members since 2012 until today, specifically headed by uh, Mr. Asam Hadi and Mr. Mishal al Hello, and the um, uh, distinguished members of those boards throughout the years and the advisors to the boards. Uh, we have managed to uh, engage in educational activities and to establish business alignment, uh, we have also um, offered consultancy to different organizations uh, in the kingdom. We have also been engaged in um, motivating uh, Bahraini members and uh, conducting different events in terms of conferences, workshops, seminars, and social gatherings. This is briefly what the society has been doing since 2012 until today. And we're looking forward to a brighter future, of course, with our members and um, our newly uh, um, uh, members in this society. Now, let me just um, not take so long and go to our speakers. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Fay bint Abdullah Al Khalifa. She is the director of the e learning center uh, at the University of Bahrain, and she is an assistant professor of architecture. Uh, the title of her uh, speech today is. Um, actually asking if there is a market for smart sustainable urbanism at the Kingdom of Bahrain. Let us see together if we really have this or not. Um, Dr. Rafael Khalifa Khalifa um, leads two teams of specialists and multimedia experts and is playing an active role in managing the digital transformation process at the University of Bahrain, specifically throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, she is also an assistant professor with a master's degree in building uh, conservation and urban regeneration and a PhD in sustainable urbanism. Her research aspires to contribute to the understanding of smart sustainable urbanism within the context of transformed cultures, urban islands, and uh, she was part of a team who won the Golden Lion Award in the uh, Venus Biniale in 2010, and she was awarded the RIBA's President's Award for Research in 2012. Um, she is interested in the implementation of smart urban solutions to achieve sustainable urbanism, the dynamics of sustainability assessment tools, 
smart sustainable urbanism indicators and the influence of visualization on the opinions and actions of decision makers. She has published a number of uh, journals and conference uh, proceedings in um, well-recognized uh, journals internationally. And uh, she has founded the Smart, uh, Smart Sustainable Urbanism Lab, the SS, uh, SSU Lab, and the Reality Lab at the University of Bahrain. And she's currently the lead researcher in a number of research projects to investigate the use of artificial intelligence in built environments, visual discomfort in urban areas, smart sustainable urbanism, and smart sustainable real estate development. Let us all welcome Dr. Faye Bitajalla Al Khalifa. Thank you very much, Dr. Aisha, for the lovely uh, introduction. And I thank uh, the Soci Society of Technology and Business um, for this uh, lovely invite. And um, hopefully throughout the discussion today, we can shed uh, some light on a few concepts that um, I find interesting myself and I form my research projects around. Uh, I just uh, shared my screen. If you could just let me know if, uh, <clears throat> if you can see my screen here. Yes. Okay. So today we will be talking about if there is a market for smart, sustainable urbanism and how do we evaluate the, mar the market and how do we know how much is that market worth uh, in Bahrain? Um, I'll start by defining the terms and then I'll move in to talk about uh, SSU technologies, what makes uh, urbanism smart to achieve sustainability. And then we'll shed some light on the markets themselves. How do we know that there is a market and how do we evaluate it? And then we'll talk about the challenges to smart, sustainable urbanism in general, and in Bahrain specifically to think together if Bahrain can set an example for smart, sustainable cities in the future. Uh, so as you can see from uh, the screen uh, here, this is uh, the new uh, urban world um, graph, and it shows that in the region, in the Bahraini region, I don't know if you see my, um, uh, my mouse, uh, marking uh, a circle on the region, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE. We are all uh, very urbanized countries um, uh, and uh, the populations are over 75%. The latest figures uh, show that Bahrain's uh, urbanization is between 90 to 100. So there's really anyone in Bahrain who's considered rural today. Uh, furthermore, 80% of the population uses social media, according to latest February figures of this year, 99% internet penetration in Bahrain, and 128 uh, of the population is with mobile connections, which means more likely than more, uh, one person would have more than one mobile connection in Bahrain. So this shows that we have a really great infrastructure in the country that allows us to uh, think about the smartness of things and think about how smart technologies could be included in every aspect of our lives today. I'll just shed the light on two uh, different fields than the urban uh, environment or urbanism. The first one is education. And as you can see from the statistics on the screen here, now being the director of the e-learning, I see this on, my, uh, on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. Uh, today, we have 100% usage of our online platform, the learning management system. We couldn't have dreamt of something like this three years ago before the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, we had about 20 to 30% usage of our LMS system before COVID-19. And today we're talking about more than 1,000 faculty, a little short than 3,000 students are using our LMS every day for every aspect of their education. So we're completely remote 100% online and everything, including lecturing assessments and everything else. So the usage of the system and the figures and the graphs here show and gives us uh, confidence, first of all, in the infrastructure and in the knowledge that we have on how to use those, um, um, those systems. We faced uh, some digital uh, literacy at the beginning of the pandemic that we uh, were able to, uh, in a very fast um, pace, uh, overcome. Another sector, uh, now this is, uh, when I spoke about the educational sector, we're talking about uh, self-driving education, if we can call it like that, uh, because everything's uploaded online, students can uh, do things online, the, the, the system can um, help the instructor develop their uh, materials online very fast. Now, similarly, in the financial sector, we're talking about self-driving money. And in, in every sector, we're seeing a technology boom that allows us to automate our processes. And this is something that I hope will come to Bahrain soon in the future. 
So companies like uh, Wealth Fund, Bettermont, and Vanguard are now thinking about or have been thinking about for a very long time uh, how to automate and how to um, automate our uh, financial system. So you get your paycheck, uh, it gets into your account, it automatically pays your bills, and it's divide, it divides your investments. Uh, so it's more of a financial advisory business model that uh, uses your uh, investment and put them in a specific algorithm to allocate uh, the client's assets to achieve optimal risk adjusted returns. And um, uh, these are things that uh, we haven't dreamt about in the past and now are becoming a reality. So the valuations of those three companies in the US are growing you know, on a daily basis. So in a nutshell, uh, you cannot today talk about uh, the smartness of things without talking about sustainability. And you cannot talk about sustainability without uh, having a conversation about the smartness of things. Uh, so the recent literature on urban sustainability stresses on the relationship between the two concepts of smart and sustainability. Uh, there is no one best meaning or one best definition for what smart sustainability means, whether in urbanism or in every, in every uh, other sector, because all of those terminologies benefit from the international debates around what sustainability means and its different meanings and definitions. So smart urbanism is sometimes referred to as emergent urbanism or open source urbanism or even sustainable or collaborative urbanism. So you can see that they are very interchangeable terms that are used together. For the sake of this presentation, we can define smart cities or a smart city as a high tech intensive advanced urban settlement that connects people information and city elements using modern technologies to create a greener, more sustainable city with increased quality of life and a competitive, innovative commerce. Uh, so as you can see from the definition of a smart city, sustainability is there. And when we're talking about the quality of life, um, the environment, we for sure have to have a conversation about uh, sustainability in smart cities. There are seven drivers to what uh, compromise uh, um, or comprise a sustainable urbanism or sustainable city. The first one is compactness, and we are rethinking this now with the pandemic, how close we should be together. But um, smart urbanism is built on uh, the processes of bringing, bringing people together and um, really using every inch and every centimeter of the city in its best potential way. Uh, complexity, uh, some smart urbanism or smart cities are cities that are very complex, so the systems come together and they're very rich and varied to uh, use uh, used to being used collectively for the benefit of, um, of their inhabitants. So ideas like mixed use, for example, are ideas that are very popular in smart and sustainable urbanism. Uh, just yesterday in the news, uh, we're hearing about um, Paris becoming a 15 minute city which means you have everything within a 15 minutes walking distance and today with the new technologies that we have and the new normal that we're all going through like uh, working from home and being educated from home this is becoming uh, more of a reality than ever before connectedness not only in the sense of uh, coherent uh, physical networks uh, in terms of bicycles or trams and cars and all of that but also connectedness in the virtual world like we're doing today Collaborative, the smart cities are places to foster cohesiveness, uh, uh, senses of community, and uh, also they build uh, social capital. And I'm going to talk about ideas of how we can bring back the society together in a virtual form rather than in a physical form like we used to do, uh, to do before. Uh, the other three are uh, coefficient. Uh, smart cities are very context related. Um, and they pay attention to the environment in which they are situated. So it's very important that we pay attention to the climate and the cultural constraints. They are very co-productive and they are adaptive to change. And I'd think that anything today, any business, any city, any organization that is not well adapted to change uh, will not be able to continue its existence in today's fast changing world. Coolness as well, because cities are not boring places that could be replicated elsewhere in the world. They, they should have their own cool character and their own identity and culture. And Bahrain, particularly speaking, has a very rich culture that should remain when we're talking about smart, sustainable urbanism. So in a nutshell, this is how we define it. You see from the picture on the right hand side here that we have different variations of how we organize our urban spaces. In Bahrain, we have two systems, the grid system and the curvilinear system. 
And I'm going to show how uh, we uh, use that in the research in a bit. Just keep that picture in mind. So research showed that different communities are likely to develop a slightly different or significantly different varying conceptualizations of what sustainable urbanism means to them, depending on their economic, environmental, social and political and cultural circumstances, or even the value judgment of the local community. So throughout the research that we did at the University of Bahrain, we tried to identify or define what it means for the Bahrainis uh, to have a smart, sustainable uh, city. Uh, what are the indicators to that and what is of most important to them? So we made research that investigated decision makers and also uh, the general public. So a smart, sustainable city is an innovative city that uses ICT technology or other means to improve the quality of life. And if you remember the graph that we uh, that I presented earlier about what it means to have a, a, a smart city, it's all about the quality of life, efficiency of the urban operations and services, compactedness and competitiveness, while ensuring also that we are meeting not only this generation's needs, but also the future generation. Uh, the measuring of a smart, sustainable city, it's not only important to know what it means to have a smart, sustainable city in the local sense, but also how to measure it. And this is a, a significant barrier to achieving smart, sustainable urbanism globally, uh, because there are no clearly articulated methodology for reporting on the sustainability of the urban environment. And Bahrain is no exception to that. Uh, we try in Bahrain to report on the SDGs and the government is constantly trying to report on that using the, uh, the VNR or the Voluntarily National Report on the SDGs. And we, we're trying in Bahrain to align the SDGs to the government plan of action. So we have uh, four national priorities for Bahrain, people, planet, prosperity, place, uh, peace and justice. And through the government plan of action, we try to map them against the global goals of 2030 and the SDGs to, uh, to show how well we have achieved in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, today, Bahrain identifies 169 objectives for the achievement of those 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, there is a group of experts that are identifying 232 indicators to measure the achievement of sustainability and SDGs. And we have tested those indicators and we have questioned them several times and we have looked into them in relation to the ISO standards, for instance, and to see how other nations are measuring their SDGs um, and the work that we do. Uh, the indicators um, are monitored on a semi-annual basis and the targets and indicators are re-evaluated every year. So any organization that would want to uh, see how well they achieve in terms of their SDGs need to have um, uh, those indicators re-evaluated uh, often to see if they are still aligned with the strategy of the company or the nation or the city or whatever it is. And in Bahrain, because we have a governmental plan of action, so we're trying to um, achieve that in that sense. Today, we can say that 78% of the SDGs are aligned with the government plan of action, but the government plan of action is still um, dependent or uh, reliant on three pillars, so the environment, the sustainability, and the economic. And in my humble opinion, I think we're missing on the cultural and the political, and they are very important aspects that should be included in any conversation about sustainability today. So how to advance and sustain the contribution of sustainable urban forms to the goals of sustainable development with the support of ICT um, and advanced computing? Uh, SSUs or smart sustainable cities or urbanizations entails more than just implementing technologies and strategies. Um, they also are about understanding the city itself or the particular need of the people and stakeholders that uh, work at the city. And we're gonna see how this is implemented with the willingness to pay shortly. There are a number of technologies uh, that we should talk about when we're talking about um, uh, the implementation of technology into the building uh, industry, real estate sector, and the building uh, technology sector. Blockchain is, is one of the blooming ones, uh, although I'm hesitant to think that blockchain could be uh, used in Bahrain to the fully in the real estate sector because of the specific uh, economic and political uh, dimensions that um, form our real estate and building industry environment in Bahrain. But they could be of great use to uh, some of those services like the rental system in Bahrain. They are helpful to avoid fraud, uh, to create smart contracts between the different stakeholders in the building industry or real estate sector. 
to reduce the number of mediators um, uh, like brokerage and, and, uh, and, um, and related um, fields. Uh, fractional ownership that is becoming very popular now with the blockchain. Uh, previously, a person uh, either could or couldn't own a property. Today, we're talking about that people can share a property with other people that know each other or don't know each other. Uh, it keeps uh, up-to-date and relevant property information uh, in an open source for the public to view, something that we are particularly missing very much in the region. Uh, virtual and augmented reality, Professor Sal is going to shed some light on this uh, later on in her presentation about the use of virtual and augmented reality. And at the University of Bahrain, we are now establishing the reality lab uh, to look into that and to see whether uh, presenting things to decision makers would actually change the decision making process using the virtual and augmented reality. Uh, they are greatly helpful in remote viewing and virtual tours in, in today's uh, fast pace of uh, work. You know, we don't have the time to go do the viewings. So those who would like to invest in the real estate sector can take faster decision making remotely using virtual and augmented reality. It increases the efficiency, efficiency of property marketing as well, because we, not only that you can see the building in a two or three dimensional world, but you can also immerse yourself in it and imagine how your items would look inside of a space, for instance. Uh, it has its time benefits and it covers multiple stages of the sale, buying, and even decorating processes. Another booming uh, technology that uh, will have a great potential in the real estate sector is business intelligence and the use of big data and app development. Uh, there is a huge amount of data uh, from the sales and uh, uh, of the real estate every day, for example, we can, um, deal with this uh, big data in a better way. I was just in a conversation yesterday with the SLRB and we were talking about this um, idea that the data is the new oil and uh, they do have all the aerial imageries and the geospatial information of the entire country to the degree that we have accuracy of five centimeter to seven centimeter of everywhere in Bahrain today. But unless we put this in app development and we develop the platform for this to be used by different industries, there's no, no use of that data. So for sure, business intelligence needs to come into the picture to help for decision-making processes by uh, putting in the right reports in the right hands. Uh, business analysis algorithms to predict relationships between, for example, what a buyer wants and what they see in terms of adver advertisements uh, is very important and booming today in the real estate sector. And I think it should um, have its own market in Bahrain. Lastly, smart homes and smart societies, perhaps maybe this is more uh, understandable by everyone in Bahrain because anywhere you go today in the market, you can see refrigerators, air conditioning units and TVs that connects your Wi-Fi and connects your mobile devices. Uh, and also we are having uh, new ideas about uh, housing communities or housing community apps. Uh, previously, we uh, knocked the door on our neighbors and we knew who they are and we could exchange goods with them and services and so on. Today, we don't know who our neighbors are. So we're talking that we're uh, lacking this uh, community cohesiveness in our urban environment in Bahrain today. So how could we bring this back together? We're thinking of ideas to bring them in in the virtual world. So you create an application where you are sharing um, your neighborhood uh, information and uh, you know that uh, you know your third neighborhood is um, you know a three adults two children um, uh, house with three cats for instance you can share uh, a hammer with them or you can share a ladder with them you can ask them to babysit your kids at certain times all of this in the virtual world so we're using such technologies um, uh, to bring back uh, society's cohesiveness uh, in the virtual world rather than the actual world so how do we know that there is a market for all of these applications in Bahrain? And how do we measure uh, what is the worth of this market? So that's that's how what we're trying to deal with in research. Uh, to demonstrate this, uh, I'm just going to play a little game with you that's called Which Would You Rather? And this is a game that I play with the kids at home and we ask them um, random things like, which, you, which would you rather to get stuck in wet pants or wet turtleneck t-shirts uh, or shirts, for example, for the day? and they select based on their opinion. We do uh, have choices every day as consumers. When we go to supermarkets, we have you know, 100 brands of shampoos and we have to select from them. Because I'm presenting to technology and business society, I have three examples from uh, the technology and business industry. Uh, so help me Kauter in uh, the first poll here. So just select between those two mobile devices. So which would you rather? 
a mobile phone uh, that is available now. It has 12 hours of battery life and 256 GBs of memory or would you, and cost $600, or would you select a mobile that costs $700 available in three weeks, not now, but would have a longer battery life of 17 hours and a memory of 128. Uh, so just go ahead and click on your selection in the poll. Let me know, Kelter, when everyone has uh, made their selection. Perhaps we can see the results. Okay, I think everyone has made a selection. So you see that 44% have selected mobile A, while 56% have selected mobile B. I'm sure those who selected mobile A or mobile B are shocked at why other people have selected the other mobile. Okay, so let's make another selection. So if you were to select between two banks, Bank A has 20 locations around Bahrain and ATMs, uh, 20 ATM locations, has a great online banking service, but require a minimum deposit of 50 BD. Bank B has 24 locations around Bahrain for an ATM, uh, has an average online banking service, but requires only a 20 BD for a deposit. Which one would you select? They say that people can only make a number of selections per day cognitively. So I'm sorry, I'm taking three selections from your uh, daily selection capabilities here for this exercise, but let's see the results later. Uh, Kelta, do we have the results now? Okay, so again, 68 have selected bank A and 32 have selected bank B. Okay, the last thing we're going to we're going to select from is two cards, card A and card B. With card A, I mean credit cards, with card A you will have an average air miles value, you will have a great online banking service and up to 200 BD in overdraft limit. For card B you will have an excellent air miles value, you will have an average online banking um, and no overdraft. Which one would you select? Do we have the results, Kelsey? Okay, so 55% have selected card A and 45% have selected card B. This um, process is a methodology that we use in the research to determine people's willingness to pay. Um, and um, for example, in this uh, example that is in front of you here with the cards example, we have three attributes. The attributes are air miles values, online banking, and overdraft. And by weighing them together and asking people to compare between those different attributes and the different levels of attributes. So air mile values will have two levels, which is either average or excellent. Online banking will have two levels, which is great or average. And the overdraft varies between zero to 200 BD. And uh, using this, we can determine the people's willingness to pay to each of those attributes. And by determining them, uh, their willingness to pay, we can determine if it is feasible to introduce a new feature into the market. 
So this is called choice-based conjoint analysis, and um, it's a method that is used in market research mostly to help determine how people value different attributes, functions, features, or benefits that they want to introduce into their business uh, for the preference identification in multi-attribute decision-making processes. Each attribute that we uh, present or each feature that we present into a business, of course, is costly and would cost uh, money. So therefore, it would only be profitable to the business to introduce this attribute if the cost or the willingness to pay for that feature by the, the market is um, far exceeding um, how much it costs by a comfortable margin. Uh, so we're trying to do this now in a conjoint analysis to determine the willingness to pay of people to smart, sustainable urbanism in Bahrain. And the attributes that we're looking at are the urban form. There are six types of urban forms. For example, would you prefer a, a linear neighborhood with a small garden? Would you prefer, for example, a, a curvilinear neighborhood with a big community garden? Uh, these are six attributes. Housing attachment, would you prefer attached or semi-attached or detached home? And how much are you willing to pay for that feature? So how much are you willing to pay to move from a detached house to a, a semi-attached house or to attached homes? Uh, of course, semi-attached homes are those who are attached from two sides or from one side only, attached from two sides and detached that are freestanding. Parking, most of the houses in Bahrain now have two parking units, but how much are you willing to pay for a third parking unit? or space in your uh, in your house. Distance to retail, uh, would, are you willing to pay more for walkable distance or not? And how much are you willing to pay? And so on and so forth. So we're mapping those attributes to what the, the people want in their neighborhood or in their um, urban environment to see how much are they willing to pay for it. We are particularly interested in the smart house and smart neighborhood applications. So if we were to sell you the house and tell you, well, it includes uh, smart metering systems and CCTV cameras, and you can connect to your neighborhood using your mobile app, are you willing to pay an extra 5,000, 10,000 or 15,000 BD towards the, the price of that house? Uh, so eight attributes are included, the 23 levels or choices. And if we were to do and map all of these together, we will have 2,304 combinations for people to choose from, which is very hard in, in research. You cannot just sit someone and ask them to map, uh, you know, and choose from all of these. So we use fractional factorial design to do that, which means we selectively choose a number of combinations that would give us the same results that we aspire to. Uh, finally, uh, we have five challenges to the implementation of smart, sustainable urbanism in general, even with applying all of those research methodologies. If we don't have strategic assessment alignment to our uh, goals, then it becomes just a label without really a real validated content. Uh, mitigating measures, cities must have mitigating measures at times uh, like this now, like the COVID-19 era where things uh, go differently. Competence, uh, we need to work on uh, how both city officials or administrators and ICT companies need to work together to increase um, the awareness of how to use uh, ICT solutions and the competence in that field. Uh, we need to think whether locally we want to work with a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach, uh, depending on the value judgment of our community. And finally, governance. Uh, we would like to see more uh, IT companies getting involved in the decision making of what makes up a city and how we design and how we plan our cities of the future. Generally speaking, Bahrain with no doubt is moving forward uh, towards a more sustainable future that uses ICT and other technologies. Uh, the government and business sector are continuously trying to reform their structures and systems to align policies to both government plan of action and also global sustainability and smartness trends. We can measure the willingness to pay for smart sustainable solutions today using research and uh, doing that uh, uh, by, by doing a fractional uh, pictorial design, we can achieve that to investigate the market size and, their determine, um, uh, and to determine the availability of options there. Few challenges remain that needs to be addressed as I have uh, just presented, but hopefully inshallah Bahrain, we can overcome all of these challenges. That was it for me today. Uh, please feel free to capture and share if you'd like to contact me for any uh, future collaborations. Thank you very much. And back to you, Dr. Aisha. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Fay, for uh, such a valuable input on the field of uh, smart, sustainable urbanism. 
we have really enjoyed uh, the content of your presentation and we uh, enjoyed the uh, questions. Uh, and I believe there was a full um, contribution from the audience today. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, moving to our next speaker, Professor uh, Sarah uh, Wilkinson, who is um, a professor of sustainable property from the School of Built Environment, Faculty of Design, Architecture and Building at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, the title of Professor Sara today is Using Virtual Reality Technology to Understand Willingness to Pay for Green Infrastructure and Residential Development. Professor Sara is a Chartered Building Surveyor and Australia's first female professor of property. She has developed and led property programs in the UK at Sheffield Hallam University and Australia at UTS. She is an active member of RCS and API. She contributes to accreditation of courses nationally and internationally. She has transdisciplinary research program, sits at the, uh, sits at the intersection of sustainability, urban development and transformation with a focus on green cities, and preparing our urban environments for the challenge of climate change. She is interested in using new technologies to deliver sustainable building outcomes, and she works with academic and industry partners in engineering, science, health, and business to deliver housing, building adaptation, sustainability, resilience, and green infrastructure projects. Um, her recent uh, work includes a project that uses virtual reality to assess customers' willingness to pay for green infrastructure and residential development. And a recent City of Sydney funded project developed a prototype wall bot uh, to inspect and monitor green walls. An updated version of this bot has been developed in partnership with UTS Center for Autonomous Systems and uh, will have pruning and weeding functions paving the way for smart green wall installations. That is all welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Sarah Wilkinson. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen and uh, there we go. And do my slideshow, so. So I'd like to thank you all very much for from you and to also share this research about uh, the application of technology to further knowledge and understanding about what people think and feel about their environment. Um, I would say that during Dr. Faye's presentation, my internet was freezing a little bit, so I do apologize if um, I do freeze. Uh, for a while, but um, it did come back. So the content of the presentation today, um, it's a project that I'm doing with KH, which is the Stockholm is a little bit about green infrastructure um, and then talk about some of the challenges associated with green infrastructure and then a bit of the context for why we're getting more interested in green infrastructure in Sydney and Australia and also in, in Stockholm and Sweden and possibly Bahrain too and then talk about virtual reality and how we're applying that to learn more about green infrastructure and people's willingness to pay for this green infrastructure. So green infrastructure, um, definitions of green infrastructure, um, it uh, includes things such as green roofs, uh, green walls, uh, could be parks, could be trees on a roadside, it could be um, water sensitive, um, sustainable urban design, such as uh, swales that catch water when you get excessive rain. 
Green infrastructure can be internal, within buildings, within shopping centres, offices, or it can be external. There are a number of social, economic and environmental benefits associated with green infrastructure. And I have listed some of the benefits here. So we have economic benefits of thermal insulation, which saves money on energy consumption, uh, could be um, food production, local food production. So you get uh, access to healthy local food. Social benefits, it provides a space for relaxation and meeting with friends. It also provides space for conservation of endangered species, so the biodiversity. Environmental benefits, uh, plants uh, absorb pollution and uh, give out oxygen, so it improves air quality. At the city scale, um, if you have enough green infrastructure, it can actually attenuate the urban heat island. So the urban heat island is this phenomena where, where you get very high density development with heat being expelled from uh, HVAC systems. The outside becomes up to five degrees hotter than the suburbs, but having green infrastructure in the form of green roofs and green actually lower those temperatures. And then pollution, habitat for biodiversity and uh, stormwater attenuation when you have sort of intense rain. What we've found is that we tend to classify green infrastructure in its primary benefits so you might your primary reason may be that um, you want to have thermal insulation to reduce your energy bills but you will also get co-benefits so they, those benefits come regardless so this slide here shows a, a table of um, I think we've got that sixth benefit there of, of looking at green roofs as an example. So as I say, you might have a green roof for thermal insulation, stormwater attenuation, in that the, the, the green roof actually acts like a big sponge to soak up excess water and slow down the runoff into the drainage and sewer system. Uh, biodiversity, uh, conservation of local plants, the flora and fauna, possibility for local urban food production and or provision of social space. So you've got the primary reason listed in the second column there. And as you can see with each primary reason, you will get co-benefits. So if for example, your primary driver is Continually your flooding and the stormwater, you're going to get thermal improvements, you're going to attenuate the urban heat element to some extent, you'll improve air quality, and you'll also provide um, some habitat for biodiversity. So these are the co benefits that come with that primary. So as you can see, there's lots of pluses for having green infrastructure. But equally, there are a number of challenges. And this slide lists the challenges. And you can see we've got four key challenges here that go from economic, environmental, social, and technological. So the economic challenges are perceptions within the industry, and I speak here for Australia, of high installation costs and high maintenance costs costs. Um, when developers are, are looking at the specification for developments, they're, they're wanting generally to uh, make as, as much profit as possible. So things that are expensive and may have ongoing costs tend to be um, considered 
not as attractive as some other areas. Also, we don't know what the value uplift of green infrastructure is to capital and rental values. And that's what the research is trying to address this gap in our knowledge and understanding of if I put a green roof or a green those technologies, uh, plant life cycle and replacement rates, what does that involve, which plants are good, which are better than others. And we've also got competition with other sustainable technologies, so rooftop solar and photovoltaics. With the social barrier, we're looking at occupational health and safety during this and the maintenance. One of the buildings we have in Sydney is called Central Park, and that's a high-rise residential tower that is about 35, 40 storeys high. And the maintenance of the green walls on that building is undertaken from a window cleaning cradle. So you quite often walk past the building and see the maintenance personnel that are hanging out of a window cleaning cradle and obviously if it gets windy it gets more dangerous and it gets to a point where they have to stop the maintenance activities so some, some issues there and then technologically um perception of uh, green roofs if it if how do you track the keys how durable is it? How often do you have to maintain it? Can you get access to the roof for installation and maintenance? It might be issues about overshadowing, orientation and access to sunlight. And generally, because we haven't built a lot of buildings with this technology for many centuries, there's a lack of understanding and capacity within the industry and also a lack of guides and instruction managers, um, manuals, sorry, for property managers and facility managers. So these are a number of barriers and challenges that we've become aware of for green infrastructure. Just to, like to talk a little bit about um, the temperature. <laughs> so our climate is getting hotter um the fi figures uh, on this slide are stockholm and if you look at the temperatures that they've got um 12.5 degrees celsius and uh, on the left hand side i think um, anyone in australia and possibly bahrain would think we would love to have temperatures like that <laughs> would seem very cool um but this these charts are taken from a website called climatechip.org, and this is using data provided by the United Nations. And what you're able to do on this website is pick anywhere in the world and you will get uh, your area today. So the chart on the left-hand side shows Stockholm today. But what you can see is from 1991 to 2017, there was an increase in the annual average maximum temperature from just over probably 9.2 to 11.6 degrees Celsius. So that's over a period of 25 years, 27 years there's been an increase in temperature of, uh, let's see, nine, ten, seven, over two degrees. Um, but we wouldn't notice it on a day-to-day -day basis. The chart on the right hand is from different climate centers. So I think there's a Japanese one, 
there's a German one, an American one, and they all use slightly different algorithms to predict where they see temperatures go into. So you can see there is some variation in their predictions, but they're all heading upwards. And um, from 1990, um, going up to 2085, you can see there's a substantial increase in the order of five or six degrees. We definitely need to look at ways of cooling down some of our cities if we can. So what I would say is um, go and have a look at the Climate Chip website and uh, put in Bahrain and see what temperatures you get for today and then click on tomorrow and see what's predicted and that will give you some idea of the conditions that are expected for your area. And uh, as you can imagine for Australia, it's getting very, very hot. And so what we're concerned with is the impacts on health of uh, the population that in the future, as the temperatures get hotter. There's also the issue about the temperature becoming so hot that it becomes unsafe for people to work outside for extended periods of time. So um, that may have implications, of course, for construction. So what we were interested to do here was to use virtual reality uh, as a way of taking people into an environment and they could have a look around. Um, the virtual reality scenario enables them to be in a space and to explore an environment in real time. So we've got some definitions here. So the first definition there, using computer science and behavioral, behavioral interfaces to simulate in a virtual world of behavior of 3D entities, uh, which interact in real time with each other or more users in a pseudo natural immersion via sensory moto channels. So this gave us a great opportunity to get our research participants to a virtual world and have a look at environments that we had created. And then to ask questions about that. Now, the interesting application we initially were going to also use with this was emotive headsets. Now, I don't know if any of you have come across emotive headsets, but this is a headset with a number of nodes that go over your head and they measure brain pulses. So when we feel different emotions, there are electrical impulses in our brains that go are activated from different parts of our brain and different levels of intensity. And so our initial aim was to have our participants with the virtual headsets. We would be able to get quant quantitative data looking at tracking their eye movements, you know, what they were looking at, how long they were looking at those particular features for. And we would also have the emotive headsets being able to measure whether when they were looking at that particular component, they were feeling relaxed and calm, or whether they were feeling anxious or uncertain, all those, those sorts of things. So we would have this quantitative data and then we would follow that up with a semi-structured interview to get qualitative data so we would then be able to ask them what did you like why did you like it what do you think we were also working with a developer to base ourselves
in a research discipline for the research the property market they were looking to because they were interested in the apartments that the developer had for sale and they would have an idea of the price and value of those developers apartments. Unfortunately, of course, the COVID changed that somewhat. And so we've had to readjust our data collection methods. So we're still going in virtual reality or something for the future. Now, the other part of this was the willingness to pay. And as Faye was saying earlier with her Hello, sorry about that. I think uh, I've been out for a little while. Um, do apologize. So I was just about to say about the willingness to pay. And um, this is something that Faye is also tackling in her research. And what we were finding that um, the benefits that result from ins installing green infrastructure could be divided into tangible and non-tangible. So the tangible things can be quantified. So for example, if we're getting energy savings from thermal insulation, we can work out the reductions on our energy bill. The non-tangible things is the things like biophilia. Now biophilia, is the sense of well-being and calmness that humans experience when they're in nature. So we've not yet been able to, to quantify that. Um, we do know that there's an increasing rate of investment in green infrastructure. And so it's apparent that there is a perceived value for stakeholders um we're not sure what that is at the individual house or apartment sales level and uh, so what we then did was we looked at all of the factors around willingness to pay and this is where my colleague from the stockholm school of economics uh, professor richard wayland came in uh, because as an economist He's very much aware of the, um, the factors that affect willingness to pay. Um, and categorize values in terms of environmental, values, economic values, and social values. So you can see from these slides, some of the kids. So uh, just for example, say looking at um, the category of air quality. As I say, carbon dioxide is sequestered and absorbed. And so that's a social uh, and uh, community value. Uh, removal of volatile organic compounds internally and externally is an environmental and a social value. However, the um, quality of life categories such as um, increasing of surrounding property values, that's an economic value. So these values come in different forms. And this slide here continues that table uh, and looks at some of the, the other aspects that I've talked about, such as stormwater management, biodiversity, urban heat island, acoustics. Um, 
interestingly, he also added tourism to that uh, list of values. So um, the opportunity to create space for people to come and visit, the go and visit to um, to have a meal uh, or to have some entertainment or the place to to see the city from. And then finally, the real estate value. So this was the um, theoretical diagram that uh, we came up with. And this is the main sort of theoretical model that we're working on in our research. And our research will be um, analyzing all of these aspects um, to see if there is a willingness to pay and how much that willingness to pay is, what sort of percentage it is. So where we're at at the moment, and just to, to summarize, we have um, designed a survey for the qualitative data. So we have um, developed four different scenarios for a residential development with the virtual reality and uh, this is really interesting because the participants can scan a QR code to access the virtual reality either on their computer or on their telephone and then they look around the development they can go into the apartments uh, the, the first scenario has very little green infrastructure and the fourth scenario is exactly the same development but this time with a lot of green infrastructure. So we've got green roofs, green walls, we've got courtyards with lots of greenery, ponds um, and features. And then we ask them to do a survey, which of the developments they like the most and then with the apartments, which of the apartments they like the most and why, and how much would they be prepared to pay for it. So we're collecting data now in 2021. And uh, we've already produced a couple of journal articles uh, at this point here uh, to date, uh, which was really talking about the theory uh, and the concepts. What I think is that this methodology is very transferable into other areas. And I think use the virtuality to market property for sale so that people could have a look around an apartment before they physically go there. So what I've done in this presentation is define green infrastructure, talk about some of the challenges, talk about the context for needing more green infrastructure and the application of this technology to test out these four different um, scenarios using a willingness to pay model uh, to see how much people are prepared to pay for different levels of green infrastructure. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and hope that I didn't freeze up too much this, <laughs> today. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be very happy to, to answer them. I'll stop my sharing now and we'll go back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sarah, for such an insightful presentation today and remarkable outcomes. Um, and this would bring us to the end of the presentations for today. And now it's time for the discussion with the panelists and answering questions from the audience. Um, I can see that we have um, three questions here in the chat. Well, um, let me just to look at the first question from Mr. Yasser Al Yusuf, and he's asking, um, "What about the artificial intelligence and the smart city as a technology?" Uh, I believe uh, 
Dr. Fay and Professor Sarah as well highlighted virtual reality, blockchain, business intelligence, and big data, and so forth. Uh, what about the artificial intelligence? Uh, should I answer that, Dr. Aisha? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so uh, of course there are great applications of artificial intelligence uh, in the building industry um, to, to form the smart city and we're seeing a lot of them uh, today in Bahrain even. I mean, we're having conversations with the SLRB and um, uh, the Ministry of uh, Municipalities to look at the building permits process and try to use artificial intelligence in the building uh, permits process uh, to sort of reduce the human errors. That's one application, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. in how artificial mm -hmm. intelligence could be used uh, in the building industry. There are way too many applications. All of the things that I have presented as well, um, uh, some of them are in relation to artificial intelligence. Uh, for instance, the robo-advisors model that, um, that I have presented briefly at the beginning of my presentation, talking about how can we automate uh, real estate investment processes mm -hmm. using computer algorithms that would automatically uh, tell you which uh, investments are right for you uh, with a risk adjusted um, uh, criteria that suits your needs. Uh, so that's one other uh, application to it that relates to smart city. Smart city is a very huge uh, topic and uh, the use of artificial intelligence uh, in it could be um, of importance in so many different fields and aspects. So these are just a few to mention, but I think there's a booming need uh, in Bahrain uh, for the use of artificial intelligence in smart cities. Yes. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Fay. I believe, uh, Professor Sarah, you have tackled artificial yeah. intelligence with the emotive headsets, right? I'm sure there are some algorithms in there to measure the behavior yeah. of the brain, and uh, I'm sure there is machine learning as well embedded yeah. in there. Absolutely. I think, I mean, it's a very interesting area, and I think we're at the beginning of something here and it's uncharted territory. So I think in some respects we must tread carefully because there's ethical issues that we need to consider about people's rights to privacy. And so we have to be very, very careful. Um, I went into the supermarket last week and uh, I walked around the corner and there's this machine, probably about two meters high, traversing down the aisle. And I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a huge column moving. And I thought, what's that? And uh, I, I got closer to it and it said it was for spillages. So I thought it was a, a robot that cleaned up spillages and um, I talked to a friend of mine who works for the supermarket chain as a project manager. And she said, oh yes, but it has sensors that scan shelves as it goes down the corridor. And then it, it tells us what we need to stock, to restock the shelves. And um, that was amazing. I don't know if you have those yet in Bahrain. <laughs> Not that I have seen yet. No. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for making us yeah. ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very funny because a few weeks ago I was given a talk and someone said to me, what's the office going to look like in 50 years time? And I was, oh my goodness. And I, I thought, what would the office look like in 50 years? And then I thought to myself, well, what did the office look like 30 years ago? Or 40 years ago and I can remember my secretary the first computer I saw and I, I went into the office one day and she had this enormous white plastic thing on her desk and I said to her what happened to your typewriter and she said um, oh I've got this I said what is it and she said it's a computer There's a glitch here. Uh, Professor Sarah, I think we lost you here. Thing. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I think technology is changing quickly. And so it's hard to imagine totally what the future will be like. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. And um, yeah. uh, this, this was my, one of my questions, to be honest, uh, for you and for Dr. Fay uh, regarding the smart sustainable urbanism field. Um, what was it, uh, how was the field like a few years ago, let's just say five years ago, and how do you see it in the coming five to 10 years from now? I'll let Faye answer that one first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, you know, I remember from the times that I was doing my PhD, the, the, I, the, the understanding of sustainability changed from that time to today. And uh, that uh, hasn't been a very long time since I was doing that. So we were thinking of, uh, sustainability as just those three pillars and I remember in 2014 uh, publications came that says well sustainability is not only about the social economical and the environment it has other aspects into it and the frameworks for sustainability kept on changing up until it was fused with the idea of what a smart city is and people started to think that um, well, we know we cannot have a smart uh, city without thinking about sustainability because a smart city should also be sustainable. Otherwise, it's not going to be a smart city um, or the smartest of cities. Um, so I think it's, a, it's a, an ever-evolving field uh, to try and redefine again and again and again what it means for us to have a sustainable community and what it means for us to have a smart community because... Uh, smartness is very much related to technology and the technology keeps on evolving. Therefore, our idea of what makes us smart would keep on changing yes. forever. Uh, so I think it's a, an ever evolving field. That's how I, how do, I would want to put it. Professor Sada. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think today, um, technology, is a tool Ooh. hopefully I've come back have I come back yes yes <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> um I think at the end of the day all of the technology is a tool and we must always remember that the the humans really are the smart things and we we make decisions based on a whole raft of factors and and I do think that sometimes just because you have the technology to do something doesn't mean to say you should actually use it or do it. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, what we're finding is, for example, here that a lot of employment is being lost to technology and machines. So the supermarket shelf filler and the cleaner is now the robot, um, mm -hmm. but that's putting someone out of a job. And so, um, yeah, we need to think about mm -hmm. those things too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Professor Sarah. Let me look at the questions uh, from our uh, audience here. Uh, there is a question uh, from um, Mahmoud Khan. How uh, your research addresses the misuse of technology, for example, encouraging disinvestment into green infrastructure? So is that to me? Yes, possibly. Yes. yes, because it's about the green infrastructure. So can you repeat the question, please? Uh, how does your research addresses the misuse of technology? That's, that's a good question. I mean, we haven't yet um, explored that, but I think um, that's probably a good research project for someone to, <laughs> to do, uh, possibly a PhD, um, because I'm sure there may be some misuse of technology and it may be some of it is unintentional, unintended, and some of it is perhaps 
it's planned and uh, intended again. I guess we hope that I think we lost Professor Tarek again. Uh, Professor Sara, we lost you again here. I don't know if you can hear sorry, me. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I can just hear you Can you, you please now. repeat? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, I guess we have in our governance and policy frameworks, we have some check or um, using technology and we have to make a case that it is ethical and is, is not going to have adverse impacts on people. Um, but I'm, obviously I think as the technology evolves, it evolves sometimes quicker then our rules and regulations, they tend to take longer to implement. So sometimes it's uh, there might be a little bit of catching up to do uh, as, as things roll out. There is uh, another interesting question by uh, Kai here. Uh, what are the thoughts about waste management or better uh, the material resource management? as we humans produce waste daily and need to be addressed in urban planning as well. So what are your thoughts about the waste management? Yeah. Well, I think, Karen, there's examples of uh, separation of waste. Um, so you can separate your uh, organic waste. And uh, I've seen places where that organic waste is then collected and as it decomposes, the, the gases that are created are then used as a form of energy. So there's some sort of um, recycling or circular economy type of approach um, to some waste. And then you've obviously got um, separation of waste that can be recycled or reused. So perhaps paper, glass, um, those products um, and then try and minimize um, other forms of waste um, so that hopefully um, you're not sending so much to the landfill sites. If I may answer that as well, uh, Dr. Aisha. Please um, go ahead, Dr. The idea of waste uh, production, I think, is lacking in Bahrain and in many regions around the world. Uh, the information and data that will help consumers or those who are producing the waste monitor their consumption and monitor their uh, behavior in terms of recycling. Um, if I do this often in my resource management class and I ask my students, um, where do you think your garbage goes? And uh, they don't know. They don't know what happens in, uh, with their garbage after they throw it out in the uh, trash bin. And some of them don't even know how it is taking outside of the house, let alone how the country is processing <laughs> that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, waste. So I think um, talking about technology and the introduction of technology and the idea of smart cities, if we allow a consumer to know uh, the life cycle of a piece of item uh, that is, uh, or maybe uh, the, the amount of uh, trash that is taken out of the house in terms of solid waste, and where does it go and how much it affects the overall uh, environment, uh, that would change uh, consumers' behaviors in that sense. There are ideas as well of uh, letting um, uh, neighborhoods or neighbors compete um, you know, in, in the amount of trash that they're taking out. Usually we don't know, you know, we go out into the trash bin that uh, is shared between the neighborhood and we see, I don't know how it is in Australia, Professor Sarah, but here in Bahrain we have at the, the top of the street, there's always a, a big trash uh, bin that all of the neighborhood throws their trash in it. And sometimes we see it overflowing uh, with all sorts of items and we don't know who this item belongs to. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think there are many technological uh, 
advances that could help us today to monitor these processes and create competitiveness uh, in between the neighborhood residential areas and buildings, for instance, to monitor where what waste goes and to better inform the public on, on how to improve uh, these processes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Professor. I, sorry, yeah, I think just looking at Kai's um, follow-up question there about integration into um, the planning system. Um, I think what we're starting to see is greater interest in circular economy principles. And so the idea of um, facilitating through the planning system uh, greater ability for people to sort and recycle. And as, as Faye was saying, if we integrate that with better monitoring and perhaps feedback to people so that um, they can get uh, a greater appreciation of where their waste goes to and what it can be upcycled into or recycled into uh, would be very useful. Thank you, Professor Sara. Um, Dr. Fay, there are a few questions here that are related to Bahrain. Um, one of the questions here is uh, from Mr. Khaled Jalal. Uh, how do you see the smart city sustainability uh, being looked at in Bahrain and what sort of strategies are being in place? Yeah, and I think, I'm sorry. Yeah, if there, are, if there are any that you know publicly. Yeah, um, I think we're lacking in Bahrain one holistic vision of what sustainability or what smart sustainability means. Um, I think we do have a clear image of what we consider sustainable in terms of our governmental plan of action as I presented in my presentation, but we're lacking um, a unified vision of what we think smart cities should be. Uh, I think there are great uh, initiatives that are happening both in the private and the public sector, um, specifically now in the last uh, year or so with the pandemic, we are seeing a lot of businesses, a lot of governmental sectors trying to be uh, smarter and smarter to cope with whatever is happening now. And uh, people are taking technology seriously and they're taking uh, technological interventions in their businesses seriously. So we now know that unless you convert uh, and uh, become adaptive to change, you are going to be obsolete in a, in a few years uh, to come. Uh, but I think we are still lacking an overall vision for that. And the research that we're doing in the University of Bahrain, we're trying to define um, what we think smart sustainability should be and what are the pillars to it, what are the indicators and what are the KPIs to measure and um, uh, to see whether we have achieved what we claim to achieve or not. But I haven't seen any robust uh, one overall image in that sense uh, for, for Bahrain yet. Thank you, uh, Dr. Faye. There are um, way more questions in the Q&A uh, chat box as far as I can see, which uh, indicates that the audience are so much interested in the talk today. So if I may ask you to answer them uh, by uh, text. Uh, after we uh, wrap up this session and uh, I will hereby close the session for today and on behalf of Technology and Business Society we extend our great thanks and appreciation for you and we appreciate the, the time you took from your busy schedule here today and the outstanding and insightful presentations you provided. Uh, a big thank you from our heart and from Bahrain specifically to Professor Sarah Wilkinson for joining us here today. Dr. Afay, we took you from the university and from the e-learning center, so excuse us for that. Very much appreciated, interesting and informative session for today. Thank you very much and hope that we can see you in further events. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And we hereby uh, end Likewise. the session for today. Thank you very much.